Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. EWTN gives me this privilege of introducing to you men and women who, in their love for Jesus Christ, end up coming home to the Catholic Church, often when that was the last place they wanted to go, and sometimes it's returning. I get a lot of emails from uh, many of you who enjoy the program. Often we have clergy converts, those who were never Catholic and came home to the church, or lay converts. But often you'll say, man, we want to make sure we hear stories of those who were Catholic and then went far away from the church and came home. Well, such is the case tonight. Our guests on the journey home are Rick and Kathy Townsend. They're from Ohio, very near my hometown. It's good to have them with us. So thank you for joining us on the journey home. And Kathy and Rick, thank you for becoming the guests here. Uh, I know you're both accustomed to getting up in the pulpit as Pentecostals, but you may not be used to being here, being here on the journey home, but thank you both very much. We'd love to hear your journey, so why don't I get out of the way and invite you to start from the beginning. What was your formation as Christians growing up? I grew up as a Nazarene. Uh, my grandfather and his cousin actually built the church that our family went to, and was Nazarene clear up to the point and after I married my wife, which was Catholic from birth, I, I was Nazarene. And, <laughs> but I was always drawn to the Catholic Church, even as a young kid. And uh, I seen the Catholic Church with its, its beauty and its background and its traditions that just, there was something that drawed me that mm. direction even from the beginning. And then I met my wife. No. Your dad was a Nazarene? My dad, my grandfather, yes. Well, that pretty well stretches back to the beginning of the Nazarene church then. Yeah. I mean, in many ways. Many I mean, ways back. Yep. So really, your, your family was involved with the whole Nazarene movement. Yes. For those that, that are watching that may not be familiar with that, I mean, the Nazarene movement was one of the breakaways within the Pentecostal movement um, as they differed in their understanding of the gifts and the use of the gifts, but right. a very strong right. uh, uh, Commitment to Scripture, commitment to holy living. I mean, a very good, good group of Christian Absolutely. brothers and sisters. That's right. And uh, definitely, you owe your faith to Jesus Christ to those faithful, amen, those witnesses. What about the Catholic Church growing up? I mean, you said you're drawn to it, but uh, did they speak highly of the Catholic Church in your background? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> Many times, my my father would tell me, "Son, I love you, but you're going to hell. When are you going to come back to the church?" Well, I did come back to the church. To the church, okay. which he may not have accepted yet. Uh, uh, he's passed away now. All right. Okay. So, well. it, at the end, I think he really realized that I was as much a Christian as he was, because yeah. many times he'd ask me to pray for him. And you don't normally ask somebody that you don't think's a Christian to pray for you. Yeah. 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 But he asked me that several times. You know, that, that really is, when you think about it, maybe the most important thing. At least we want them to understand that we are, we're, we're on the same team. We love Jesus Christ. And right. Whether they accept the fullness of the church, well, that's up to the Holy Spirit. But you want them to know that you love Jesus as much as you ever did before. Right. But now you, you're really following them more deeply. So in the process, you met a Catholic woman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Protestant first nightmare. <laughs> These were Protestant parents. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, but were you brought up in a real strong Catholic environment? Uh, yes and no. Um, my, I, like you said, I was a cradle Catholic, and I really didn't even realize I was Catholic. <laughs> to be honest, I don't really remember going to church. Uh, we, when I was in grade school. Uh, my parents put me in St. John the Baptist Catholic Church in Churchtown, Ohio, and uh, their, their school there. And when I was in the second grade and preparing for First Communion, Sister Vianney, my teacher, called my dad in and said, she can't make her First Communion unless you all start going to church. Now, unbeknownst to me, my dad went every Sunday, <laughs> but my mom and us kids did not go. And part of that, the reason behind that was my mom was not Catholic. Mm. <clears throat> and she had also been married before my, and had a daughter when she married my dad. So even though my dad couldn't receive the sacraments or anything, he still went to church every Sunday. Well, from that point on, we were all in church every <laughs> Sunday after Sister Vianney laid down the law. And we went, <laughs> a 
country family. We went to 7 o'clock Mass every Sunday. I didn't know there was any other time you could go to Mass. Uh, we went to confession every other Saturday. We had to go to confession. If we didn't, we couldn't go to communion. Every holy day we were in church. But there was still always that, you know, I was raised Catholic, going to the Catholic school, but I don't think I really understood yeah. what it what it meant. You used the phrase, had to. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had to go. My dad was a very strict disciplinarian, and you had to go to church. Yeah. Now, once I reached 18 and went away to college, I didn't go to church. Yeah. And I, I wasn't mean, going to church when I met him. The, the had to part of it is not necessarily bad because when you realize why God wants you to go to church, then you understand the had to. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, if you don't get the other half right. of it, then right. that really is a, a, is a burdensome thing. Which, mm -hmm. like you said, once once you're free from family, you can yeah. be free from you church know, too. I, I was free. <laughs> I didn't have I didn't have to go to that seven o'clock mass. <laughs> and we got married. We weren't originally married in the church. We, we ran off to Virginia and got married because my parents did not want me to marry him. <laughs> both sides. Obviously. On both sides. It, it wasn't. They weren't happy with this. And it was two years later when our son was born. And, of course, it was important to me to have him baptized in the church. And parish priests wouldn't do it unless we got married in the church. So we had our marriage blessed in the church then and went off and on then after that I point. I forget where Nazarenes are on, on baptism. Do they baptize infants? Um, no. You have to be of age. All right. So mm -hmm. there's that old issue then, too. Right, mm -hmm. right. Which I'm sure it wasn't a big deal between the two of you. To... No, I, <laughs> I actually wanted him baptized. That's why I agreed okay. to, to get our uh, marriage blessed in the church. Is I agreed with it. Yeah. You know, if, if we can't look at the basis of what our, our Bible is written on and what it says, then what faith can we even have if we can't believe what's in the book? Yeah. How can we believe in something we can't see when we have trouble believing what we can see? <laughs> so, yeah, I was uh, I was happy with it, and it actually helps actually start a, a unity in the two families that way from mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. It actually did, because you know I think from the, the Nazarene side of it, my my dad especially would he could see that there isn't that much difference between the two faiths really. Yeah. You know, the, the same kind of prayers. And, and I don't understand why there has to be this division. Hmm. Uh, I, there, there's got to be a way that God's church can come back together and work as one. Yeah. It's yeah, got to well, happen. That's been a really, especially in the last 60 years, been a, a central part of, of, uh, of the church's commitment, hmm. whether it's dialogue or even at times admitting that we've, we, we've made mistakes in the past. You know, people within the church made, so there's all kinds of efforts trying to establish this unity, but it's got to come from both sides too. Right. So, so at least there you approached baptism of your, your first. And what would, mm -hmm. would the priest say? Did let you do it? or No, no we, okay. we had to have our marriage blessed in the church. Okay. He knew mm -hmm. we weren't married in the church. And I, I think he was more okay with it than me, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm sitting there thinking, well, we're married. You know, what difference does it make, you know? But I went along with it. And we, you know, over the years, this, we ended up having four children all together, our son, three daughters. And we started going to church more, you know, with us. We had the children and everything. Of course, they all started receiving Had you joined the Catholic Church at this point? Yeah. Okay. A few years later, I had you joined. joined and you were now going to the Catholic Church mm -hmm. during the, as your family grew. Mm-hmm. Started to... Uh, both of us teaching CCD classes. Um, our CYO group, there was a seminarian in our church in uh, Parkersburg that uh, was the head of the CYO group. That was his position while he was there for that semester. And when he left, I took over as the head of the C CYO group and stayed with that clear up to the point we left Parkersburg. I went to South Carolina with my job. and. Uh, we was involved in the church mm -hmm. down there, too, mm -hmm. CCD classes and stuff. In fact, I joined the Knights of Columbus in, in South Carolina, third degree night, still am yet today. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just been a ride, that's what it's been. When you look ride. back on that time, Rick, I'm wondering, theologically, had you made the shift at that time from Nazarene to the Catholic, or you just... 
in your heart? Had, had you made the shift or you just saw this is the Christian community, the whole big it thing? It felt right. It, was, it felt right. I couldn't say that I made a, a full 100% yeah. commitment to the Catholic Church because there were some things I could you know, see being preached that still was dragging up past from the back from the Nazarene. And, and I'm going, you know, I have an open mind. That's why, you know, people I deal with are a lot of different mixed race people. And, and in fact, the, the church we were at in South Carolina this last weekend was a, a black church, yeah. a black community. And it doesn't bother me. I, I don't see color. I think yeah, we're all right. varying shades of brown. It's the same way with, with God's church. It's all God's church. There's only one God. Why do we have to put these walls up between yeah. the denominations? Let's go home to the mother church. This thing called pride. And, and that. What about yourself, uh, Kathy? Were you, as you become more and more and more involved, was your, was your childhood formation coming to life? Or? Not really. Um, I, I was a Catholic, I guess, in name only, like a lot of Catholics. You know, I went to Mass every Sunday. I spent a lot of time back in the cry room because children were little, they'd make noise, so you'd take them back there. So was I an active participant in the Mass? No, I'd receive communion when they'd knock on the window and it was communion time. And, and, but I was. I was teaching CCD classes. I've taught everything from preschool up to 7th and 8th grade, which we taught together. Mm-hmm. But I, I would say that, that my understanding of the Catholic Church stopped when I graduated from the eighth grade Catholic school. And I just, you know, it was just, it was a church. I went there every Sunday, you know, and you had to receive communion. You know, you had to be baptized. You had to make your first communion, be confirmed. I knew you had to do all this stuff, but I really didn't know why. It was just what you did because you were Catholic. It's easy to get into that Mm -hmm. when we have a faith that the externals are so much a part of it Mm -hmm. that it can be easy where the externals become the majority of it as opposed to the internal Mm-hmm. Understanding. Right. I mean, it's sad. It's not just a Catholic problem. That's a, any church, like Episcopalianism, High Church Lutheranism, anything that mm-hmm. has these externals is a very valid part of the church. It's not quite so easy in a Nazarene church. Well, sometimes, I'll tell you, you, know, I, you can fake the gifts, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right, in the right. charismatic communities. Yes, you can you kind can. of, you know that because you, mm-hmm. well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, <laughs> right? Because uh, you you didn't stay in the Catholic. What happened? Uh, is it time to get to that? Or yeah, yeah. Um, what happened is because of us not growing in the Catholic faith. Um, in fact, we even said it to ourselves several times. This is dead, dull, dry, and boring. Why do we do this? <laughs> and God seemed to. It seemed to us that God moved us, moved us out of there to a. Uh, Pentecostal church and within three years of being there I was a licensed minister now, was this a Pentecostal like the Nazarenes no it was a full Pentecostal church oh, okay. independent full it's like the uh, um, oh Benny Hinn okay. there'd be one sure, sure. Uh, yeah flowing in the, the uh, fivefold ministry and all the gifts and yes it was uh, it was attracting it was attracting. And what, uh, two, two years later, I was ordained and uh, sat as uh, assistant pastor for three years before getting my own church. So, Whoa. where were you in all that time? I was right there beside him. Um, I, like him, I, I was questioning, is this all there is? You know, there had to be more. There had to be something else besides just going to Mass every Sunday. And the particular preacher that we had met, and we had met him through a business that I had. I was running a grocery store in Delhi at the time. He and he, him and his wife started coming in and talking to us. He was a very charismatic man. And I, I can't really say it, that I had an intention of leaving the church, but he, they had invited us to go see a Christian comedian, Mike Warnke. And he used to be Catholic. And they figured, you know, this would appeal to us, you know, as Catholics. And I, when they had the altar call at the end, I went up. You know, I I went up. I, you know, I wanted to be saved. I wanted to be like these people. They seemed like they were having so much fun. And and, uh, the very first service we went to, as I had said before, my mom was not Catholic. Uh, The very first service we went to at this preacher's church, here was my cousin, my mom's cousin there. And so this made it seem okay. You know, yeah. here's, here's yeah. Cousin Delta. She's at this church. If she likes it, this must be okay. 
And I know family at the time questioned me, you know, well, do they speak in tongues? You know, and I'm like, yeah, well, doesn't it scare you? And it didn't. It didn't. There was an attraction for me to that. It was exciting. It was new. The music was different. It was, you know, it sounded like the rock music that I like to listen to on the radio. And, and these people, you know, they were good at plugging you in immediately and getting you very involved in the church. And I just, I felt like, oh, okay, this is what it's all about. And, you know, they were very big on, oh, you got to read your Bible. And I started reading the Bible and everything. And it just, it seemed right at the time. It seemed right. <laughs> And, and you're uh, supported by the community mm -hmm. who all felt it was right. And, of course, you have people that are, their lives seem to be a good model of Jesus Christ. That's mm -hmm. right. And they love our Lord, and they're mm -hmm. dedicated to our Lord, and they're reading the Bible. They're praying. I mean, it's all the right stuff. Mm -hmm. At least most of the right stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. It's, and it, it does. It entices you in. It draws you in. And you can be drawn in and become part of it or be drawn in and become lethargic hmm. about it. Because I've seen some people that come in yeah. and walk back away from it. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, quite, a, quite a ride with the, uh, the church. <laughs> it was uh, a lot of the people we dealt with were, were street people. It was a, a spinoff of a street ministry is what it was. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a... a food pantry, uh, clothing, uh, people come in. We've had the, even the, the sheriff's department call us and if we had clothes for people that uh, had lost stuff and we could set them up with clothes. We had churches donating to us. We had more clothes than the Salvation Army. <laughs> 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 but it was, uh, it, it was, we we done a lot of good. We've seen people come to the Lord hmm. and that is the most important part is right. people coming to the Lord. And we ended up, because we spent so much time in the church, our girls especially got left behind. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it got to where we were at church so much, they didn't want to be there all the time. They didn't want to be around some of the people they were around. So we let them stay home, mm. unsupervised. These were teenage girls. Teenage girls. <laughs> was this also at the time when you got involved with radio ministry? Was this? Yes, yes. Um, the The original church that we were involved with, the original preacher and his wife, they had a ministry on the radio called Street Beat. And the pastor and his wife were doing the show. They had been doing it for a couple of years. And originally it was on, on Sunday evenings. And they would have people could call in with questions and things. And they got... Rick and I to start helping out with that. That was my introduction to radio was people would call in with questions and and one night I even had a lady call in that had been her boyfriend had just shot her. And, you know, she was like, What do I do? And I'm like, Well you need you know, you need to call police, you need to get to the hospital. But we had, you know, phone calls like that and from that they started doing the show on Sunday morning. Well, this was hard for him to do, him and his wife, to do the sh radio show on Sunday morning. And, and it, they played contemporary Christian music. And it was hard for them to do the show and to do, you know, the church services, sure. too. And so they started getting me involved in that part of it, to be a DJ. And so I did. I became a DJ, and I was on two radio, radio stations simultaneously for quite a while, doing the show all by myself. And our oldest daughter at the time was 12 years old, and there was a young man in the church that was 14, and he, the young man had been helping. He was good at doing audio and stuff like that. Well, he wanted to be on the air, so the, the pastor put him and our daughter Jennifer on one of the stations, and I was on the other, and we were playing contemporary Christian music, and I did that for a couple years. It was from 6 o'clock in the morning till noon every Sunday. I was CJ the DJ, and... <laughs> <laughs> really enjoyed that. It, it was fun. It, it was yeah. different. It was fun. And, you know, people would say, you know, I'd see people that knew me. Oh, I heard you on the radio. And it, it was fun. And and through that, I got to go to the Dove Awards one year. We all went down there. And, of course, that was fun because when you're a DJ, sure. you get to go backstage and meet the, the artists and get to eat lunch with them and everything. And it, it was really it was really a good time. It was fun. You know, we were doing so many things that were fun. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're also implying that there becomes that real fine line between 
you're doing ministry, you're doing it for the Lord, mm -hmm. and then it starts impinging on your family. But I'm doing yes. a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a good thing. And pretty soon, you're not only trying to convince yourself, but you're trying to justify what goes mm -hmm. on in your family. So you're saying that start to have impact on your, on on your kids. daughters. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we talk with you know, our elder preachers that we have around us all the time, and they'd say, well, just put it in the Lord's hands, and you continue to do His work, and, and He'll take care of your kids. Well, no, God didn't raise those, uh, bring those kids. He, he give them their spirit, their life. It's up to us to take care of them. Yeah. It's up to us to raise them. It's not up to him. It's up to us. That's our job. That's why we're called mother and father, because we're yeah. supposed to be that. You know, he's all our father. Mm -hmm. And and I I really, it was hard to turn turn away from the church. It was hard to let go of the church. It was hard to walk away. When I closed the church, I tried to get pastors to take the church. They would none of them take it. The people was there. I, I tried to get them in, in different churches so that they were ready to go when we closed the doors because I, I told them this is coming. This is what's going to happen. At that time, you were doing that because of your family. Right. And that's rough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We actually moved from Parkersburg, West Virginia, where the ministry was, to Toledo, Ohio. Yeah. That move to the, the girls needed a new start. Mm -hmm. They needed away from people that was taking them down a path they didn't need to go down. And they needed a, a new fresh start and parents that actually cared this time. Well, and you were giving up your stuff too then, right? Oh, yes. Yes. And I was at rough. the church. I was at the church more than he was because <laughs> he had a full time job while we were doing uh. this. So running the church was left to me, and I was. I was there almost 24-7, and the girls were. They, the, the two youngest ones, our, our son by this time had moved out. He had gone off to college and moved out. Actually, he was married at yeah. that point. Mm -hmm. And our other daughter was 18. She moved out as soon as she turned 18. We'd had a lot of trouble with her. And mm -hmm. then we still had the two younger ones that were 14 and 16 still at home. And it, it had reached the point where, through prayer and everything, I had told Rick, I said, we really need to get the girls out of here, or we're not going to have a family left. And it was within that week that he was offered a job in Toledo. <laughs> so we knew God was in that. Mm -hmm. And we moved to, we actually moved to Perrysburg say, Township. I was going to say, there's a notorious species of human beings called PKs. Yeah. Pastor's kids. Yeah. Pastor's kids. And we do it to them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We, you know, the ministry is so important, but being a good father and a good husband and a mm -hmm. good preacher, yep. it's tough. Yes. That's right. And then you got two of you doing the same. Mm -hmm. Tough, tough. Absolutely. And we actually, we stayed in the, the Pentecostal church. We, we joined one Moved in Perrysburg. Toledo, right? Right. Okay. We joined one in Perrysburg. And, and I don't know whether God started working on me first or on him first, but I know after mm -hmm. we had moved up here, I started feeling disenchanted with hmm. what we were doing. And I Were you seeing the differences in the Pentecostal churches maybe? Was that No, I don't think it was that. God okay. started showing me hmm. through reading the Bible that I started seeing the Catholic Church in in some of the scriptures. I started <laughs> seeing Catholic teachings. And I had gone to the pastor that we had at the time and I said to her one day, I said, I've got a question for you. I said, what did the early church do? Did they have services like this? Is this what they did? And she really couldn't answer me. She went, oh, yeah, this is what they do. And I said, are you sure? Yeah, 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 this is what they did. <laughs> and I, I, I wasn't satisfied with that. I really wasn't. And, and the more I read the Bible, the more I started seeing the Catholic church. And I I didn't know, you know, you hear a lot of out of returning preachers say that they read the early church fathers. I didn't know about the early church yeah. fathers. I, I knew about all kinds of other faith preachers and their books and everything else, but I knew nothing about the early church fathers. And I was taking care of my grandson at that point at home every day so his mom could go to school. And I one morning flipped on the TV and it there was EWTN. Now, we had had EWTN on our TV all along. Never watched it. Never watched it. That was Catholic because at this point, I had actually turned my back on the Catholic faith. Yeah. And I, you know, was had never going to go back. Did you become an anti Catholic, ex Catholic, or just. To a certain extent, I would still defend the faith, like if someone would say that the Pope is the Antichrist, you know, or something yeah. like that. But 
yes, I had. I mean, I had thrown away rosaries. I had thrown away everything I had that was Catholic at one point because I was told it was cursed, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And Did you confirm that idea with her? No. So I didn't know about it. <laughs> I, I really started watching, e- I, I, this one morning turned on TV and there was EWTN and this nun on there. And I started to change it and I realized she was talking about the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, the Holy Spirit's not in the Catholic Church. And the more I listened to her, she was talking, same understanding of the Holy Spirit that I had. And she was talking about the Spirit moving and all of this. And I'm thinking, nah, this can't be right. It sucked me in, though. And the more I watched it, the more I started realizing, hey, I didn't know this. And the more I started reading the Bible, the more I started seeing what she was saying. Then I started praying the Divine Mercy at 3 o'clock every afternoon. Had to hunt through the whole house to find a rosary because my one daughter still had one. And But... It was just, it was through that, hmm. that God was pulling on me. And, and one... Did, did you know this was going on? Not really. Uh, we never talked about it. <laughs> uh, she, she just, she came to me one day, because uh, I worked the third shift at this point in time, uh, and it was, my days were upside down. If you've never had to work third shift, it's mm-hmm. the worst thing you yeah. can ever do in your life. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said... There's a church I'd like us to go to. And I said, okay, where and what? And um, she's a, it's, it's a Catholic church, but it's, it's supposed to be charismatic Catholics. And I went, charismatic what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, at that point in time, I was ready to do something because we were doing absolutely nothing for ourselves or for God at that point in time. We were trying to be good parents, but if God's not involved, then you're not being good at anything. You're just going through motions. Why don't we take a break there? That's a good time to break, and we'll come back. And Because uh, I'm also interested in finding out you left the ministry behind, but there's a part of it when you moved that you really left a lot of it behind anyway, didn't you? Because of maybe burnout or what you saw. Let's talk about that when we get back, and then we'll we'll continue journeying into the church. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host. Our guests tonight are Rick and Kathy Townsend. And I jumped right in the middle and cut you off when we were talking about you're just starting to look back at the church. But I want, I did want to just address one thing, which I think is, is interesting, because I've seen it happen a bunch of times when guys are, and, and women are very, very, very involved, and they recognize they've got to make a change, and you make the radical change. You don't just come down to a lay level. Sometimes you do drift out of it because you've been so involved in leadership. Is that kind of what happened to the two of you? Uh, for me, it was time to uh, get back and ask God, what do you really want from me? What do you really, really want? Because my whole life has been, even before I married her, was the deepness inside of me was whatever you want of me is what I want to do. Hmm. And it that day she said, let's go. It just, it just rang inside of me. Yeah, let's go. Let's go see. Let's go see what it is. And we went. And I, <laughs> he told me this was a Catholic church. And Well, it is. I said, they're more Pentecostal than what we were. <laughs> and it was, it was awesome. The, the, the music was a lot of the same kind of songs that we used to sing. Uh, um, speaking in tongues and praying for people and, and seeing the spirit move in the church, it was it was something. It was it was it really hit me that God's the same God, no matter where you're at. But the difference is is the tradition of the church. The 
the most important part for me is the Eucharist. Yeah. Is the Eucharist. It. Did you have the Lord's Supper at least in the Nazarene Church? Yes, once in a while we would. Uh, in our church, uh, we had uh, communion quite often. Because hmm. communion was always, well, we had been Catholic before and we knew, we knew, okay, this is the body and blood of Christ. But we didn't understand yeah. the body and blood of Christ at that point in time. I don't know whether she may have from being you know, raised as a Catholic, but it was a symbol to us at yeah. that point in time. But that was really the thing that, that drew me back was the Eucharist. I liked what I saw with the, the, the charismatic group. Uh, the priest was absolutely awesome. He's still a good friend of ours. Um, and it's just the Eucharist. Hmm. To me, it's, it, it has gotten to the point with me is when it's, this is my Lord and my God. And it's my life. It's what gives me life, is the Eucharist. And that's what's drawn me back, was that. How about for you, uh, Kathy, when you started coming back? Had they, when you invited him to come with you, was that your first time back? Or had you slipped in before? It was the first time back. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I knew God was drawing me back. It was a, it was I think it was really a hard adjustment for me because I had been allowed to preach, I'd been allowed to teach, I, I had been going, I was singing, going around singing places and stuff. All that stopped, you know. All that stopped yeah. for me. At first, it was nice, you know. There was no demands, no anything. And after a while, of course, you know, I wanted to get involved again, and I am. I, you know, I do sing in our church. I'm a, a Eucharistic minister and a lector, and. I realized God, you know, had me where he wanted me. The big draw for me back to the Catholic Church was Mary, hmm. my mother. Even when we were out of the church, and even when I had gotten rid of everything in my house, you know, everything that was mine that was Catholic, because I had been became so convinced by people and some books that I had read that all of this stuff was yeah. cursed and it was causing all the problems in our family. I still would find myself, when I'd go to pray a lot of times, the Hail Mary would pop in my head. And I'd start praying it and immediately I'd go, no, 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 that's not right, that's not right. And I'd stop. <laughs> and, and I realized now that was Mother Mary. She was tapping me on the shoulder and saying, I want you over here. I want you here. You, you've had your time. You've had your time to learn. You've learned. You've learned. Now take what you've learned and go back. Yeah. And, and I found that that's been, that's been true. I, I have found so many people that when they find out, you know, it intrigues them when they find out I was a preacher. You know, and a lot of them assume that because I was a preacher, I think there should be women priests. And they're very shocked when I go, oh, no, no. I agree with the way the Catholic Church is. It should be men priests. This is what happened in our family when we were ministers. It's, it's very hard for a married couple to do this because it either all falls on the wife or if they're both really involved, the kids fall by the wayside. And, and I found that, that through all of that, it has opened a door for me in the church to minister to people mm -hmm. and, and to let them see a lot of times that this is the way it is in other churches. If you've never left, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the way things are. And, that you know, what we've got here is such a treasure. And, you know, we've got the Eucharist. We've got the understanding of what it is. You know, we know this is the body and blood of Christ. This is the healing of the nations. You know, this is the church. And, and I found that, you know, through Mother Mary, she opened that door and, and made me realize that, yes, this is my home and this is where I belong. How, how are you with Mother Mary? <laughs> Honestly, it's just started for me with that, uh, especially when I was this last year, I had uh, esophageal cancer mm -hmm. and I lost all of my esophagus and two inches at the top of my stomach. Well, um, replumbed and better than I was. I used to weigh 353 pounds too. Is that right? Wow. And in a little over what a year and three months now, it was in May when I was operated on a year ago. That's when suffering, you know, because yeah. I was going through a great yeah, deal we're at that point talk in more time. About that later. I want to talk about the issue of suffering. Yeah. Cool. And and it, the thing when I started looking at my suffering, you know, I, I God, why am I going through this? Because while we were ministers and preachers. We didn't get colds. We just 
out and worked and worked and was around sick people, and we never had, we didn't even have insurance at that point in time. Mm. And none of the kids got sick. We didn't get sick. It was you know, kind of awesome how we were taken care of at that point in time. And I'm going, you know, what have I done? That was my first question. What have I done to offend you? Mm. So I can make penance for it. I, I want rid of this. And, and I was found that coming that, from your Nazarene background, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you're sick, it's because you did something wrong or the unconfessed guilt of something. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I'm going, you know, what have I done so I can and can repent of this and, and, and get away from this this sickness? And and I never got any answers. It's one of the first times in my life I, I've not gotten answers when I've asked. And it, I went through the whole ordeal. The chemotherapy, radiation, then the surgery, and then a long time of recovery after that. And, well, things will never be the same for me because it's, you know, I'm completely replumbed inside and things don't work like they used to and you have to learn how everything yeah. is now. And, <laughs> and I'm going, God, you know, what is there left for me to do for you in ministry? And that's when he started putting this whole thing together working on me about suffering hmm. through this. And because I'd always read the, you know, the scripture in the Bible where Paul's talking in uh, uh, Colossians 1, 24, you know, he's, he's happy about the sufferings that he's going through. And he says, I, I lay up in my body the sufferings which were lacking in Christ. And I'm going, <laughs> what? Why? Uh, what are you talking about? What, what can we be doing with suffering to compare with what Christ did? I was going to say that's a verse that you Nazarenes didn't quote very often. No, probably. you stayed away from those. Yeah, yeah, we did too as Presbyterians. What yeah. do we do with that verse? Right? Well, we teach all the Bible except the parts we want to leave out. <laughs> exactly. The parts that we go, well, that no, that don't work. So yeah, yeah, you know what it's like, and and from there I, I just I kept starting reading and reading and reading and and. Everything I was seeing, most of Paul's writing, some of uh, Peter's, Timothy, talked about the suffering and using that suffering as redemption, having redemptive value, coupling it, offering it up to Christ and asking him to take it, change it, and use it for this person or this situation. You know, pray for people. I started out with my wife and my kids, my, my kids' spouses. My grandkids, we got seven grandkids. And then a, a pastor that we know really well down in South Carolina lost a, a grandchild at birth. And there was something going on that day I just knew in my spirit I needed to call and find out what was going on. And when I found out what had happened, I knew because I called all my kids, what's going on? Is there anything going on? No, everything's fine. We're all right. Why? Because I, I knew something was wrong somewhere. <laughs> And, and I finally got called there and found out what was going on. And, and it was really hard on, the, on this pastor. Mm. Um, her son, I mean, this, this baby was, was in bad shape. He was dead when they delivered it. Mm. And it had actually been dead inside her for a couple of days. Wow. Mm. Wow. And that was very devastating. They actually had the, the funeral in the hospital room where... Mm the daughter-in-law was at, and then he took the baby away because the mother wanted to be part of it. Yeah. So it was hard on the family, and I offered up a lot of pain and suffering for that whole group. And, and I realized, and when we were down there this last weekend and, and done a men's conference down there, you could see the difference in, in Pastor. She is uh, very receptive, very lovable, liked us for some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we were strangers to her. We had never met her till last uh, Friday. Never met her. Last Thursday. Thursday was, yeah. And uh, it was, uh, the suffering was just something that God was working on me with. And that's what the message was about down at the men's conference to, you know, take what goes on in your life, whether it be, because uh, there's types and kinds of suffering right. to go along with this. 
but it's, you know, everyday life has enough sufferings of its own, just, you know, driving down the road anymore is hazardous enough, <laughs> let alone a sickness or disease or a loss of a loved one or, or something like this. That's Keeping control of your anger as you try and survive in the world today. Well, I think you can ask her, there's been a, a, a huge change in me, especially the last three months. It's really, really been where God has, has taken situations in my life and I'm going, you know, Let's do something with this besides just whining and moaning about it because there ain't nobody listening in the first place if I'm whining and moaning. So, Lord, take this situation. Use this situation. Use it for this, this person or this situation, this group. And I've seen results from it. <laughs> and I don't know what God has in store for us or where we're going, what we're going to do next. I'm waiting on Him. Yeah. I'm wondering, in your case, Kathy brought up in the Catholic Church, sometimes mm -hmm. I think even Catholics are so used to saying offer it up, mm -hmm. but they may not truly appreciate the significance and the power of this great theology of suffering that we accept and sometimes take for granted. <laughs> I didn't understand it. And, and I, that was one of the things that Mother Angelica talked a lot about. Mm -hmm. And I... Well, we saw her for those years right, going through the right. suffering herself. And, and it really, because I, I guess I had never really thought about suffering before. And, of course, in the Pentecostal church, anything that happens, oh, you know, it's Satan attacking you or you're under a curse or, mm -hmm. you, know, you've, mm -hmm. you're, you're sin, you know, you've got a sin or something. You know, there was always a reason for it. And, and it was something bad if you were suffering. And I know through listening to Mother Angelica, she is the one that made me realize that, no, we have to suffer in this life. There's redemption in that suffering. And that through our suffering, you know, if we offer it up for someone else, you know, it, it can ease their suffering. And there's a, you know, there's a reason for all of this. And I mean, you, you look at Mary when she was standing at the foot of the cross with John and the women. And Jesus looked at her and, and, and you know, he saw the suffering his mom was going through. And he said, you know, he says, he says to John, you know, behold your mother, you know, to Mary, behold your son. He was giving his mother someone to watch yeah. over her because he realized the suffering she was going through. And that, you know, we need that. We need those people that, that are willing to hold us and, to, you know, to help us through that suffering, no matter what it is. And I know with him, it was very important to me, the people that were in my life in this past year, that, that were there, that I knew were praying for me or that would see me in church on Sunday. And of course, I always got the questions of how's Rick, Rick doing, but it, it was very few and far between that someone would put their arm around me and say, but how are you doing? And that's what meant the most to me because I knew there was people there suffering through this with me. And there to help me to get through this and, and to get through this time. It just struck me as I was thinking you described that, that so much of modern Christianity has become Jesus and me, mm -hmm. Jesus and me. And it's interesting when you think about that image on the cross, it wasn't Jesus turning to his mother and saying, just look to me, mm -mm. John, look to me. He was saying, you look to each other mm -hmm. as you seek to follow me. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the community of the church, mm -hmm. the necessity of that. We did get an email here, which I thought I'd, okay. I'd just run by, by you. Has, has Rick and Kathy's marriage been strengthened after they returned to the Catholic Church, came from Cynthia, Washington State? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I wish, uh, wish I could turn back time, tell you the truth. Uh, for what we've had in the last two years, I wish we'd had for the last, we've been married 35 years. Mm -hmm. and wished all 35 would be where we're at right now. I really do. Yeah. And um, this was the time of the suffering. And this was the, the time of the suffering. The two years of the suffering. And Absolutely. That, and may, it's made that big of a change. Yeah. And to answer your question about Mary, <laughs> because through that suffering and that cross that I was bearing, that I realized that while Jesus was hanging on the cross, there was Mary right there suffering and praying for him too. You know, the, the Bible can't describe what she actually went through. You know, say that her very heart was pierced and her very heart had to be being ripped out at that point in time to see her son have gone through the scourging that he went through and 
you know, if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson movie, that to me is the yeah. most realistic portrayal I've ever seen of what he went through. Because it, it, it drawed me to the focal point of while I'm there bearing my cross, Mary's right there encouraging me on. And yes, that's, that's turned me to actually looking toward Mary because praying the rosary had never been on my priority list. Uh, is now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, asking Mary for intercession because that's what she is. She's an intercessor. You know, Jesus was the great intercessor between man and God, you know, the, the Christ man Jesus, but he also tells us to pray for one another in his name. Mm -hmm. And so Mary's doing the same thing, only she's got first-hand <laughs> communication with her son. <laughs> so to me, it's, you know, the church has rolled all together. Everything that I have always seen in Scripture and, and felt and believed in my heart, the Catholic Church has just rolled it all together. And that's... Here, we got an email. I wanted to run this by you because this is a great question. This writes from Joan from Cleveland. How can we as Catholics keep people like Rick and Kathy in our parishes and not lose them to Protestant congregations? Do we need more fellowship, better catechesis, et cetera? What do we do? Can I answer? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is something I, I know in my case especially, I think if I, knew, if I had known more, about my faith. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the biggest way a lot of times that Catholics are drawn out. We really don't understand and know our faith. We've got a very rudimentary understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And you get around other faiths, they know their Bible so well. And so many Catholics don't really know their Bible. It's getting better. It's getting yep. better. I mean, I'm running into more and more Catholics that know the Bible better than what I do. And I'm like, wow. Well, you know. I think Mother Angelica but, and WTN right, has helped in that right. way. So but it's, it's a lack of knowledge a lot of times. And, and you, you know, there is, there is a thing, I think, in all of us that we want an excitement a lot of times. And so many of the churches nowadays with their contemporary music, you know, with their excited preachers yeah. that get up there, you know, and, and there's just all this excitement going on. Coffee shops We've, in the lobby. Right. Yeah. The coffee shops. We, <laughs> You know, we as people, we like that. Yeah. We like that. And you go into the Catholic church, it's more low key and everything. But, you know, I've had so many people that will say to me sometimes, you know, oh, how come we can't lay hands on prayer and, and pray for people like they do in so-and-so's church? And I'm like, you mean we're not allowed to? <laughs> you know, and it's like it never, you know, it's we we don't have a good understanding sometimes. And I know that was a lot of, in my case, how I was drawn out so easily. I was craving something different. I didn't really know my faith. They'd tell me these things, you know, because they'd be reading right out of the Bible. And they go, and this is what that means. So I was like, oh, really? I never knew that. <laughs> you know, and it's so easy. And I think that's part of it. We need to have Make a sure better understanding yeah. of our faith. Yeah, Yeah, having been one that pulled Catholics out of the church. I look back and that was, especially teenagers, mm -hmm. that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. They knew enough just to get them in trouble. Mm -hmm. And then I could fill in the gaps and they're gone. But I, it's just true, I don't know from you, that I recognize though as a, when I was a Protestant minister that the ex-Catholics that would come into the church, usually two, three years later, they're still going to another church. Mm -hmm. They're bouncing around mm -hmm. the lot. Because they haven't found what they're looking for. And it, usually it's the Eucharist that they're missing. That's right. Yes. The reality of the sacraments, the reality of a tr an authority they can trust and mm -hmm. be sure that, you know, that's why I was wondering if the Pentecostal church in one place was so different than the other, whether that had been a problem, because that's often the issue. Mm -hmm. The different charismatic groups have different views on the gifts and yes, whether you need them, right. and right. I mean, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, one other thing that I thought was so different from your Nazarene background in the Catholic church is the crucifix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a symbol of suffering. I wonder if you... In, for you particularly, did you have to grow in the acceptance of the of the crucifix? Crucifix? No, no, I, I haven't because I understand you know, the the plain cross that the, the Protestants use. He's not on the cross anymore. He's alive. I know he's alive, <laughs> but I see what he done for me and for everybody else. Yeah. What he went through. That's it's a focal point when you come into the church. You see every time what God done 
for us as human beings to allow us back in his graces again. And that's what it means. Uh, I never had a problem with the crucifix. We've got an email from Josh from Detroit. What reasons helped Rick want his son to be baptized as a baby? Doesn't baptism show your interior decision to serve Christ something babies can't yet do? Did you have that little bit of an argument going on in your head when you were... No, I didn't, because baptism seemed right to me. I don't know, I must have been born Catholic and didn't realize it. But (laughs) but I spent a lot of time in the Nazarene church. But to me, baptism, it it was something that I seen in the Catholic church. Because we seen when we go to church, we'd see baptisms of babies. and, And there was something there. I could see a presence of God there working while this priest was anointing and baptizing this baby. And if you watch a lot of the babies when they're being baptized, it's the quietest time they've got. <laughs> Till the actual pouring of the water on the head, some of them will scream and holler. But most of them are just like our grandson that was just baptized, just as calm and happy. Mm-hmm. Just awesome to see a baptism of a young baby. Yeah. I was baptized when, when was it? Uh, I was, what, 30... You've been now in your 20s, mid-20s. Mid-20s. Yeah. Long time ago. But even when I was a Calvinist, I, I did appreciate the fact that I didn't recognize the beauty of the actual graces that we receive. Mm-hmm. But I saw that, at least as the greatest symbol of grace, because that baby doesn't deserve anything, mm-hmm. but it received new life and, mm-hmm. and freedom from original sin through that gift of the parents, which they take on. How has your family been with your final journey back to the church? I'm actually seeing positive things happen with our kids. Really am. And uh, our daughter-in-law and our son that's going through the the cancer thing that she's got Mm. is uh, I'm seeing changes in them as well. In fact, our son, is he's very, very smart. And very, very smart people are hard to convince of anything that they can't see and touch. But he knows God, and he talks about God a lot anymore. He'll, he'll come back. Let's assume we got a few people watching the program tonight that maybe are where you were, maybe Pentecostals or, or maybe fallen away Catholics, or even, as you just mentioned, someone that's so smart that they just can't get beyond that. What would you like to say to them to encourage them to make the same journey home you two made? I'd just like to say, you know, God is always there. He doesn't change. He doesn't move. He stays in one place. He's an anchor. When everything's going wrong in your life, all you have to do is just cry out to Him. The Catholic Church, if I had to talk to my kids right now, I wished I'd have been a Catholic that I am now back when they were born. Because at that point in time, Satan would have never pulled them away. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I do want them back. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the, the power of the graces and the sacraments are how we mm-hmm. are promised to not do it without Jesus, because that's how we experience the beauty in the Eucharist. And, and yourself, Kathy, the... Uh, Oh, I guess you just need to be open to the Spirit of God. It was hard on me when I came back to the Catholic Church because I had left with such high expectations of finding God and didn't realize I had Him all along. Mm. And I, I think you just, you do, you need to, to study, you know, really look and see what the Catholic Church really teaches because there's so many misconceptions out there about the church and, yeah. and what they teach and you know and and you need to if God is pulling you in, pray and do some study and, and find out, you know, go talk to a Catholic priest, you know, get a catechism, look through it, you know, get a copy of the early mm-hmm. church fathers. Just anything, you know, to, to give you that knowledge and, and you know, just be obedient to the Spirit of God. All right. Listen, I want to thank you both for sharing your your witness on the program. I want to ask the audience to 
offer a special prayer f for your daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. who's right now still going through the treatment of cancer, mm -hmm. and, uh, and which you've been through. God, God bless for that. And we also want to offer a prayer for all of you who are watching that are struggling with the issue of suffering. Why does God do this to me? You know, where are you, the Lord? And the point is he's right there. Mm -hmm. He's an anchor. He's always there for you. You just have to turn. That's all you need to do. And, uh, and those of you especially who have walked away from the church, come back. The graces of the sacraments are right there waiting, especially in the beauty and the power of the Eucharist. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Journey Home. God bless you. See you next week.